Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malbin Greek, UK's leading Greek delicatessen, supplier and distributor of premium Greek produce. Whatever you need, Malbin Greek has you covered. You can shop online and have the divine and delicious goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK, or you can visit the shop at Art17 Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET, Bermondsey, London. Malby and Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. Hello! Welcome back to the Delicious Legacy Podcast with me, Thomas Dinas. And on today's archaeogastronomical adventure, I have the pleasure and the honor to have a fantastic guest with me. It's no other than zooarchaeologist Flint Dibble, one of my favorite people on Twitter, which um, I've been following for a few years now, like maybe four years or so, and um, I keep a close eye on his uh, adventures, on, um, on his online adventures, but more so his um, excavations and discoveries uh, from archaeological sites all over Greece. So, yeah, I'm really happy today that uh, you will um, get to hear some exciting uh, discoveries from Greece on uh, what people use to eat and what we discover and how we discover this. Um, and um, Flint kindly suggested we do a few episodes on the subject because it's a very vast and broad subject with many different uh, exciting elements. So this is going to be part one of three of, uh, of our uh, deep dive in um, zooarchaeology in ancient Greece. So stay tuned uh, for in the next uh, couple of months. We're going to get uh, more and more information about uh, the foods that ancient Greeks ate. In a few words, what is uh, zooarchaeology? Uh, before uh, Flint obviously gives us a more detailed description, but um, it's a part of archaeology that concentrates in, in studying animal remains from archaeological uh, sites and archaeological contexts. And that could be in the form of bones and remains from um, deposits of um, kitchens and uh, trash and um, food um, utensils that's been left behind, small traces and people like uh, Flint are able to analyze and find out what was cooking in the ancient uh, Greek pot. And the exciting thing is that as a discipline, it's relatively new. So there's so much potential and scope there. And there's always new, exciting discoveries in the field. And so without further ado, let's go to our guest, Flint Tibble, and um, see you soon. So, <laughs> Flynn Dibble, welcome to the Delicious Legacy. Thank you. Very delicious to be here. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for uh, the listeners that they don't know you, who are you and what do you do? Yeah, so uh, I am an archaeologist and uh, I study, well, I focus on, on the ancient Greek world and I focus on food there, specifically through studying the remains of ancient animals. So their bones, their teeth. Their, their shells, their horn cores, things like that. And uh, I connect it to historical evidence um, and artistic evidence from the ancient Greek world to get a better sense of sort of animals throughout the world. But I, I really focus on food in particular. So how those animals were raised, how they were butchered and distributed, and then finally cooked and consumed by, by ancient Greek people. Yeah. Fantastic. That's a very big... Um topic, I suppose. Lots of scope there to talk and discuss things. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, uh, because um, when you think about the ancient Greek world, you can go and, you know, you can read people that wrote stuff down from that time. You know, you can go read Herodotus and the history, or you can read comedy plays by Aristophanes, or, you know, the epic poetry, those oral stories told by Homer and other, other poets. And uh, so with that, Combined with the, the artistic evidence we have, the sculptures, the painted pots, animal bones were kind of 
forgotten about in the field for, for a fairly long time. In fact, most projects really didn't even save animal bones hmm. until fairly recently, or at least didn't save the majority that they found. Occasionally, they'd save little bits here or there from special deposits or things they thought were special. Um, and so what that means is there's a lot of scope because there aren't many people that do what I do. And with more projects wanting to be up to date in methods, um, drawing in new scientific methods, animal bones are, are now more regularly and consistently saved and studied. So there's a lot of demand for what I do. But at the same time, there isn't the same kind of research depth that you have um, sort of if you study ancient Greek art or if you study the domestication of animals, you know, people have been doing that for a very long time. Uh -huh. um, and so in that sense, it's kind of like inventing the wheel um, because uh, you need to think through how these different sources of evidence, how to, how to bring together these different fields of study, um, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because obviously we have, so far we've been, uh, we've been focused um, all the centuries on the actual texts about uh, exploring the ancient um, everyday life, I suppose. Uh, and then what? To some degree, yeah. Yeah, and then what the archaeologists found, obviously, the last centuries, it's mostly about human, not about <laughs> um, animal stuff. So, yeah, I, I mean, it seems to be like a daunting task and uh, big and um, open. And you have lots of things to do. <laughs> yeah, and you have lots of them too. You know, I mean, like you, 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 they're broken up tiny bits of animal bones. And so that makes them difficult to identify, you can imagine, when they're all smashed to bits. And uh, at the same time, there's lots of them. I mean, you know, you could fill up, uh, the, uh, I have a photo somewhere that I've used online or in lectures and teaching materials where it's just a, a colander, a small colander that you'd use for, you know, uh, straining, sp dry, getting spaghetti out of water, you know, mm. that kind of thing. And it's just full of small little fragmented animal bones and it's it's got over a thousand in it. So, you know, I myself have gone through millions of these little bits and I probably have millions and millions, tens of millions more to do, oh my um, God. as well as, of course, my colleagues, because there's more and more people starting to look at this stuff in the Greek world. Um, and so that's it's 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 good. It's an up and coming subfield in that sense, because there's a lot of material and it's new and it can shed a, a new picture on these texts. You know, those what, what what people wrote down is very accessible. You sort of get a a glimpse into how people thought, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, but when you when you have the animal bones there, it's actually what they did, and so it, it provides a different perspective. But at the same time, you you try to tell a story from these broken up bits of bone, and of course that's a that's a challenge in and of itself. I mean, only a tenth of them are identifiable, even. Um, and so yeah, it's 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 daunting to turn bits of animal bones into an accessible story that relates to this other form of evidence that other people are more familiar with, right? Yeah, absolutely. So where do we start our story from then? <laughs> start our story from? I don't know. I think it's up to you. Um, do you want to start from, what, the first animals in Greece? No, I don't <laughs> really go back that far. I mean, are, are you more interested in, say, historical Greece, like the first millennium BCE, or do you want to know more about the introduction of domesticated animals to Greece? There's sort of a lot of different stories that this, that this form of evidence relates to. Um, mm. I mean, you mentioned everyday life, and I think that that's something that actually I disagree with. So we could think about... Here's a good starting point for you. So we can think about the relationship between these accessible texts and those animal remains themselves, right? And so we think about textual evidence. We want to put ourselves into it and we can sort of see through the, the meals that we, that we read about, mm. is this everyday life? And I'd actually argue no. Mm -hmm. um, so you could think about what you and I eat all the time, right? We, we what, think about what you've eaten in the last week, what you've drank in the last week. And let's say a researcher came by and asked you, I'd like to you to write down, tell me what you've eaten and drank and what you've thrown out in the trash yeah. for the last week. And instead of giving your trash to the trash collectors, how about you give it to me and I'll compare Right. 
And uh, archaeologists have done this. In the 1970s, there was something called the Tucson Trash Project. <laughs> and a lot of people volunteered to do this. They would tell these scholars what they were throwing out. And then the scholars would actually go through the trash. And this is all anonymous, of course, you know, so. And uh, it turns out that anonymously, we lie. We lie to ourselves about what we eat and drink. And so on these, on these forms, these surveys, people would, and you compare it to the trash itself, people would say that they drink less alcohol than they uh -huh. actually do. Yeah. Or, or they eat less junk food and more healthy food than they actually do. Or in these days, of course, it's the 1970s, they read less pornography than they actually do. <laughs> and so we, we lie about ourselves. And we need to understand that the ancient Greeks did as well. And so I have a project where I, I compare animals yeah. in, in, in the bone evidence versus the textual sources. And one of the, 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 with animal bones, the problem is, is the evidence is a little more granular. And so I sort of, I count these bones, right? Mm -hmm. I, it's a lot of numbers. It's, it's quantitative. And so I, I count how many sheep bones I have and goat bones that I have. And so to compare that to textual sources, I started counting the number of times that sheep were mentioned within different, you know, literary sources. And, uh, it turns out that, you know, certain animals are mentioned a lot, but they don't show up a lot in our bones, in the archaeological sources. So they talk a lot about cows yeah. and horses, but they mostly throw out the bones of sheep and goats. And so I sort of think about it like this, where the textual sources aren't recording everyday life. They're recording what people want to talk about, right? And and things that have a little more cultural cachet to them. Yeah. They're, they're valuable to them. Mm. And so that's why they're writing a lot about cows and horses. Same thing within, you know, painted pottery. You have a lot of cows, but not a lot of goats. And so it's the exact same thing there. And I sort of liken it to Instagram. You know, if you're posting photos of meals on social media, what are you posting? Are you posting that breakfast that you have in a hurry on your way to work? Or are you posting, you know, an elaborate meal that you're having with some buddies, right? Some friends yeah. or family, something that you put some time and effort into. And so it's a little different, if you see what I mean. Than Absolutely. What actually yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes total sense. You know, uh, you, you, yeah, the significant things are happening, you record them, and then that's what stays. And what you think is significant, yeah. what you value. What you, it doesn't what mean you that value, that, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't mean that breakfast on the way to work is not important, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Think about how you feel if you skip it. And so that's still important, but it isn't valued in the same way. It's something almost as an afterthought. Mm, and, uh, mm. Yeah. Yeah, for, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's very interesting thing, because for me, obviously, I'm reading all this information from the ancient world, and I make up meals based on these texts mainly, right? Yeah. Uh, but the actual, probably what you found all these years is um, quite different um, things. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And, and there's and there's several reasons for that too, you know? So you think about those texts that you read, who were the authors of those texts, right? Mm. Who were they? Um Comedic poets, I suppose. There were um, philosophers. Yeah, but who, they, who, yeah. Like the they elite. were most. Yeah, they were. They were the elites, so they're wealthy people. Uh, they're mostly men, and they're mostly from Athens. Yeah. Right, and so that's the other key thing is you get a very, very small picture of the ancient Greek world, and it's not just that it's just wealthy and and men. It's that it's they're Athenians, mm. which means you're not even getting the picture of the larger sort of, or in the Roman period, they're, they're mostly Romans, right? And yeah. there's, there's still these kind of biases that exist in what gets written down and what gets preserved also by sort of the Christians in the medieval period, right? Yeah. And, the, and the Arabs in the Arabic world, and then the ultimately Renaissance and, and uh, Enlightenment scholars that end up recording it further for posterity. And so what actually gets preserved and transmitted and written down is just a very small snapshot of what's there. And that's also key. I mean, archaeologists have been crying about that for, for at least 100 years, that, hey, we need to not just pay attention to Athenian culture, right? There's a lot more to the ancient Greek world than Athens. Mm. And we don't get that from the, these literary sources. We get that from the archaeological record or epigraphic sources or, you know, in other periods, maybe from papyri that are only in Egypt, right? Yeah. And so that, that gives you a really much more complex 
a nuanced picture of the past. And when you think about food, it gives you a lot more diversity of what people are eating, right? And, and, and sort of uh, cultural diversity around the Mediterranean or around the Greek world, but also class diversity. Um, and so we can start to get that a little more clearer with looking at archaeological evidence and the trash itself of people's life. Yeah. So basically, so in ancient Greece now in general, uh, do we have a better picture of what different city-states uh, were eating or we still a bit muddled and we, again, you, you know more about Athens, for example, or do you know what was happening in Syracuse and Sparta and Thebes and, you know. Well, when you start naming specific named historical sites, that's more difficult because uh, we're relying upon where there's fairly recent excavations mm. that have collected animal bones for study. So, yes, we are starting to get that picture, but we're just starting to. Um, I've studied stuff at different city-states on Crete, um, like Azoria in the east, and then from, you know, the, the Greek period, not the, uh, the post-Bronze Age, after the Minoans, mm. I've studied stuff from Knossos. Um, there's been some more recent publications from sort of central Greece. Um, I think there's one that just came out by Dimitri Filioglu about Ferai. Yeah. Um, and so we are getting uh, a more uh, diverse representation of different city-states. Yeah. But that's also really fairly new. That's really just in the last five, ten years mm. um, that we're starting to get this picture. And and what I've what I've observed um, in some stuff that I've published is not so much that we can start talking about, say, cultural differences, um, in the sense that uh, you know the the Spartan city states ate like this and the Athenians like that. It's not that crystal clear just mm. yet. Um, maybe we will we'll hit that differences as 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 we get more data. Um, and evidence. But uh, what I can tell really clearly right now is the difference between sort of more urbanized uh, city states, so larger ones with larger populations, more sort of industry and commerce going on in their city centers versus more rural, smaller city states. Because when we, we, I, I think that people have a misconception of ancient Greek city states. Most of the ancient Greek city states, and we have named just in historical text thousands mm -hmm. and from archaeological evidence we have ones that are not named like we don't know uh, what what city state azoria was that's the that's the modern toponym for it right um and uh so so we have thousands of these most of them were what we would call villages of just one or two thousand people and even like the really big ones what you think of as athens probably only something like 20 to 30,000 people lived within the city boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really what we'd call a small town. Um, now, of course, what is a city-state? Athens includes its rural hinterland as well. And there's the suburbs, let's say, of Athens, larger sort of uh, towns that were, you know, not that far away, an hour walk, two-hour walk, three-hour walk, something like walking down to Piraeus yeah. or walking out to Akarne. And so, you know, those were Athenian citizens that probably came into the city on a regular basis, but they weren't living right inside the city, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So our, our picture of, of it's a little weird and wonky when we think about cities compared to today. But the larger ones, like Athens, I, I would argue from the animal bone evidence I have, or, you know, Knossos. Knossos becomes a very large city in the Hellenistic and Roman period. And so uh, it, it, it also, both of those cities that I've, I've, I've studied and published some stuff from, they have, I would say they have a somewhat different diet and different uh, cuisine than mm -hmm. the smaller, more rural ones that I've studied. I'll be back after this short break. Hello there, sorry to interrupt. My name's Dr Neil Buttery and I'm host of the British Food History Podcast, a podcast that you, as a fan of The Delicious Legacy, might be interested in. I explore British food and its history in all its glory, with interviews with special guests, recipes, reenactments, and tracking down forgotten recipes and hyper-regional specialities. Previous topics include medieval eels, 18th century dining, curry, London street food sellers, breakfast, and the good old Yorkshire pudding. Search for the British Food History Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And now, back to the delicious legacy. Cheers. Great. Um, so you, can you give us some um, examples? What, what um, was the cuisine on these places? Or Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would say that in many ways, it's sort of what you think of as well. There's, I am always reminded by this uh, cartoon by the, the, the oatmeal. 
I don't know if you guys read that or ever see it, but uh, it's sort of like a two panel cartoon and it's like uh, Asian food in a small town. Mm -hmm. And it's like one restaurant, Chinese, Japanese, Thai, uh, Korean food all in one. While, while Asian food in a large city, you have a Japanese restaurant, a Thai restaurant, a, a, a Korean restaurant, etc. They're all different. And so it's a little more diversified. Yeah. And so that's actually what I'd argue for um, larger city states in the Greek world. They, they had sort of more diversity to their cuisine. So like if you're just counting, if you go back to counts of different animals, um, they, they, they have a, a smaller city states in the Greek world. The animal bone assemblages are really heavily dominated by sheep and goats. That is the mainstay of this kind of animal protein that people were getting in smaller settlements. While in Athens, you have a much broader representation of cattle and pigs. And uh, it's tough to go into other um, wild species because we're to collect stuff like fish and bird bones. They're very small. Yeah. And so they're much more difficult to collect. And so you need to do something called flotation. Uh, where you have a much finer mesh. And that's something that has been really lacking um, in archaeological projects. So I'm, I, I don't feel confident comparing whether the Athenians had more fish or not. But I'd be, I, if I had to make a hypothesis, I'd guess that they did um, because they're probably importing a lot more mm -hmm. um, like salted fish and, and, and even fresh fish. Um, I, I would imagine into something like Athens. And we get that in the literary sources, right? You hear lots of mentions of fish. Yeah. Um, but I don't, we don't have the animal bone evidence to predict that yet. There's actually new, a new project that's starting up this summer in Athens is uh, directed by John Papadopoulos. And I'm going to be studying the animal bones from there. They're doing a lot more flotations. So we'll have a much clearer picture in the next, I don't know, several years uh, of, of, of whether that's true mm. or not. And of course, and of course, the animal bones of smaller animals like chickens, birds and fish that decompose and they're much more difficult to find um, clear evidence, right? Well, they don't decompose in a faster level than bones. Well, I mean, I guess they do sort of in the sense that if you're in acidic soil, those bones would decompose faster. But, you know, in Athens, the, the soil, the sediments that, that, that at least in the Agora, where I've studied material from and around the Agora, so the city center, um, in, in those areas, the sediment's very good for pre preservation of bone. Right. Um, and they have a lot of wells that ha that hold a lot of bones. And those wells in particular, are, uh, like, you know, so a well where you get water, when you finish using it, you fill it up with trash. And, well, animal bones are very plentiful in those wells. And those environments are really, really good for bone preservation. So I don't think that's a problem. And with the flotation that they have done over the last 20 years, um, it's not as extensive. Uh, there's been fish and bird bones. Um, so we do have some. It's just not a large enough record to be able to compare rigorously to some of the other settlements like Azoria, where we've been intensively floating uh, soil uh, for to, to collect this stuff. So we have a much clearer picture of what's going on. Right. So, I mean, I'm intrigued about Azoria because that you say that was a settlement, kind of large settlement in Hellenistic times, but we don't know the name of it. From ancient oh, no, Knossos was the largest settlement in Hellenistic times. So that's, you know, the labyrinth where yeah. the, the, that, 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 that never really, even though there's some destructions, it's never really uninhabited. Mm -hmm. It's continuously inhabited even today as a yeah. village. Um, and so, yeah, Knossos is a large city in the Hellenistic times. Um, most of the stuff recovered from there is from older excavations. But uh, the, the, the Azoria, we don't know the name of it. And uh, but it's actually I call that pretty small, right. probably something like two to four thousand, maybe two to five thousand people live there. And so what's really interesting about Azoria. So, OK, so you need to picture yourself kind of in the not quite the mountains of Crete, but it's fairly upland. Right. And it's on a it's, a, it's located at the top of a, a fairly steep hill, mm -hmm. fairly steep slope, probably just a two hour walk from the coast, though. Um, and it's in Eastern Crete, so fairly dry. And, and what we get there, it's really quite fascinating, actually, because what happened was the settlement was abandoned um, in the sort of right at the beginning of the classical period. So, you know, 
early 5th century BCE, right? And uh, it was peacefully abandoned. We have no evidence of sort of violence, but they just sort of, but what they did was they, they ritually destroyed the settlement in the sense that they, they tore down the roofs and they, they burned, they, they set fire to a couple of the rooms. And so that intentional abandonment, it's sort of the, the roofs were made of kind of straw and clay. And so when they collapsed in, it sealed what was on their sort of clay floors. And so we have these assemblages of what life was like in this town, sort of sealed. And it's like a snapshot in time of what of what people were doing around that time, around the early fifth century BCE, right in the decades, just a few decades before they abandoned it. And so it's a really, really cool snapshot of, of a whole settlement and what's going on around that time at one time. Because, you know, when you dig in Athens, it's really complicated because you, you, you know, it, people were continuously living there. So it's not like you have a clear snapshot. You yeah. have a deposit from this period associated with the construction of this building when they collapsed the earlier building and leveled out the terrain to build a new building. And then you have a deposit right next to it from 500 years later when that building was destroyed and they built a new building, right? Mm. And so it's this weird hodgepodge of stuff when you have a settlement that's continuously inhabited. And so Azoria is really, really cool because it's this cool snapshot in time and we've it's a very large project where we excavated something like five or six houses, as well as much of the kind of civic center where people were gathering together and dining in the communal dining building. And then they were gathering together to discuss the affairs of the town in what we call the monumental civic building. Um, it's sort of like a large gathering space with a few steps where people can uh, all on all the sides of the building were a few steps so people could sit or stand there to sort of give speeches or, or, or discuss what was going on. And so we've excavated these kind of different spaces there and we've used all, it's all been 21st century methods. Um, all these excavations have gone on in the last 20 years and, and so over these spaces. And so we can really compare kind of houses to what people were doing during feasts and like in Athens, that's more difficult because we've mostly most of the excavations is focused on the city center mm. and there aren't as many houses there. There is the industrial district, they call it, which they excavated. But that was excavated about 70 years ago. And so I don't think there's almost there's there's almost no animal bones from there. There's right. a few, but, but very, very few. So, yeah. So that's why Azoria is cool because it's a snapshot in time and it's more rural and it, it gives us this really cool picture. It's a really beautiful site to go to as well. Great. That sounds very intriguing. So from uh, from Azoria, you found some, in terms of um, animal bones and stuff, you found um, some clear evidence what people ate and it was different yeah. from Athens, basically. Yeah, so there they're eating a lot of goats. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very goat-heavy diet yeah. in terms of the animal protein. Of course, we also have a lot of plants as well. In particular, what's interesting is because they abandoned the settlement suddenly they 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 took their valuables with them right right and so they they took their sacks of grain they took their animals with them and for the most part they did have a little sacrificial ritual right before they left where they in different houses we get these deposits of kind of burned feet bones from cattle goats things like that from plants because they took all their grain with them. We don't have much grain, but they left behind, you know, a lot of pottery because the pottery was too bulky and valuable. Yeah. So we get kind of like their pantries, but we also get their sort of storage areas. And we have these giant storage vessels that are, you know, bigger than you and me. You can yeah. squeeze a few adult people in each. They're called pithoi and they're decorated. So they have decoration on them of mythical scenes or or different stamp, they're not painted, but they're like stamped impressions on the clay. Mm. And so they're meant for displaying the wealth of the household. But inside these, they obviously would have taken the valuable contents, but it's all crushed up grapes and olive pits. So they stored olive oil and wine in here. And at the bottom was the kind of settled occasional bits of, 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 of pits that they had yeah. and pips that they had. And so that's what we have lots of. We have, I mean, it's not like they were filled with these pits. At the bottom was just a few of them, but we have them across the settlement and it adds up to tens of thousands of these sort of crushed uh, olive pits and grape pits, pips. Pits and pips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it's kind of the, the, 
it, you can tell that the, these households even themselves were fairly wealthy and this is the their the the wealth that they're storing in there right is their their olive oil and their wine yeah and, and yeah but a lot of goats and then what's really cool is we can not just it's not just com- comparing it to Athens where you get a lot more beef and a lot more pork and stuff like that but we can compare it to here we can compare what they're eating at home versus what they're eating in their feasts right mm. and so that's that's really fascinating to be able to do that in one spot it's really rare because you know we have we have animal bone assemblages from temples that are published but we don't usually have it from the houses that are from the same settlement and so uh so they're eating the same animals at home during these feasts. So it's still mostly goats, some occasional, you know, sheep or mutton and occasional pork or beef, but mostly goat meat. But uh, and it's the same ages as well. So it's still mostly adult prime age, sort of two to three year old goats. But what's different is how they're butchering the animals. So the cuts of meat that they get for the feast versus at home is very different. Right. And so uh, they're they're using cleavers to butcher the animals for the feasts, but while at home they're using knives. So, mm-hmm. you know, a knife is going to leave like a little slice, like a little mark on a bone. You know, if you can imagine you're cutting yeah. up an animal with a knife, you'll leave that occasional little slice on that bone as you're sort of taking the meat off the bones um, and dismembering it at the joints. Um, but the the cleavers, on the other hand, are chopping, maybe not entirely through the bone, they'll chop and then snap it. And so you get half of it kind of chopped through and the rest of it kind of fractured, mm. usually. And so that's what they're using, at least for certain stages of the butchery, um, a, a for the feasts. And in particular, I mentioned the stages, what we get these chop marks on from the sort of middens associated with the feasting buildings is uh, they'll, they'll be hanging the animal up. And if you've been to Athens and you go to the central market, you can see people doing this today. Um, they'll hang the, 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 the central market, it's lamb usually. Yeah. But they'll hang the goats up and then they'll chop right down the middle of the carcass through the vertebra. Yeah. And then, uh, and either before or after that, I'm not sure, they'll then chop through sort of at the hip and at the shoulder. And uh, that's what they're using the cleavers for. So it's to sort of portion up the animal. I think of it as portioning it up into sort of six parts, you know, the left and right torso and then yeah. the four legs. And that's done with the cleavers and then the rest of the butchery is done with the knives. Mm-hmm. And so that would be more efficient. I also think that it's probably going to be part of like the spectacle itself. On Crete, you get inscriptions, for example, not at Azoria. We don't have much writing from Azoria. A little bit of graffiti on pots, but not very much. Um, but it, but from the same time period and later um, it, 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 on Crete and, and also elsewhere in the Greek world, you know, the priests that were in charge of sacrificial ritual, there's also roles that they had for butchery. So I imagine kind of this phase taking place, maybe they slaughter the animal and it's part of the, they, 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 there's a procession leading the animals in, in front of a crowd, they slaughter it, and then they kind of do this initial stage of it with these cleavers, probably in front of the crowd, and then it goes into the kitchens. And then it's used with knives and 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 butchered up and thrown into cook pots to make a stew. Mm-hmm. That's happening kind of inside. And uh, but but what this would create, of course, are different cuts of meat as well. And it would, uh, you know, you'd have better access to the marrow. So you might imagine the stew would hopefully be a little more flavorful yeah. um, from this. And at the same time, you get these kind of chop marks through the pelvis sometimes, the hip. Uh, that will portion it up. And you can see that they're portioning it up to put it into a stew pot. Um, so you might get more bones in the in, in the pot itself, like I said, and more marrowy goodness. Mm. Um, and then, then the other thing that I find interesting, and this is really, really cool, at least in my mind, I find it funny, um, is the on the floors of the kitchens of the communal dining building where these feasts are being prepared, where the meals for these feasts are being prepared, there's a higher proportion of, do- of bones that are gnawed by dogs so than there are in houses or elsewhere on the site, like outside in middens and stuff like that. And so I imagine that the people that are preparing these feasts, there's, there's more of a glut of meat and extra bones and stuff. So the dogs actually get more treats on a feast during a feast than they would otherwise during right. a family meal, <laughs> which I think is kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So basically, on that, on that, we have, so we have an animal sacrifice, 
Yeah, yeah. And then we have uh, the the whole spectacle of butchering the animal in front of people uh, in the community, then cooking it, then sharing the food with everybody there. Yeah. And this was probably, uh, Azoria was probably a restricted group because we actually have their dining rooms in this building. So the Cretans were a little weird. They yeah. didn't do things quite like the Athenians. We don't know if we should call it an Andreon. So you might be familiar with the term Andreon. That's in Athenian literature. That's where the men would yeah. gather to drink, right? Yeah. But on Crete, it's very different. This probably still used mostly by men, but they'd actually gather to eat there. And so it's part of these, instead of being in somebody's house, like it is in the Athenian literature, yeah. it's actually part of these kind of public buildings um, at the center or core of the village where people, where men, the citizen men, would gather to eat together and discuss politics. Mm. Um, and, and so we have this building that has, it, it's actually like a series of units of, of kitchens and dining rooms. Um, it's just a few kitchens and then a bunch of dining rooms. And we call them halls because we don't know if they're only used for dining. But uh, they certainly seem to have also been used for dining. And uh, so w we think it's probably something like one of these Andrea that are mentioned in later Cretan literature or later literature describing uh, Cretan politics. Thanks for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Remember, if you want the podcasts early and ad-free with additional extra content, please go to my Patreon and subscribe there from $3 a month. This also helps me create the podcasts uh, more frequently and spend more time researching for each episode. So please, 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 please go to my Patreon page and subscribe there. There are different levels for different benefits and um, also you're going to get a huge thank you from me on the next episode. This podcast can only happen with your generous support. So share and uh, review and rate the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube and wherever else you get your podcast from. Thank you, I've been Thomas Dinas and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Stay tuned for part two of Flint Dibble's exploration of the ancient Greek food with more tantalizing discoveries from ancient Athens.